and we'll get started slowly here and we'll let people trickle in. Um, and it's a little confusing. Today is a hybrid event in all its glory. So I am joining you online. My name is Jacqueline Sundberg. We have presenters tuning in from further afield as well. And um, on site, in person in the room, Anne-Marie Holland is at the front at the podium. Um, and so she'll be presenting in person and we'll be having the other presenters tuning in from the South. Hopefully your weather is nicer than ours. Um, University of Pennsylvania. Two librarians and curators are joining us today, Dot Porter and Nicholas Herman. And I'm not sure if you'll see their videos yet, but you'll see them in a moment. And I'm gonna do some housekeeping to get us started. And then I'm gonna pass the virtual microphone over to Dot and Nicholas down south. So to get started, I introduce myself briefly. I am Jacqueline Sunberg, um, and I am the outreach librarian for McGill's ROAR collections. That acronym stands for Rare Books and Special Collections, the Ulster Library of the History of Medicine, the Visual Arts <coughs> Collection, and Archives and Records Management. Today, we're going to be looking at some selections from our special collections, uh, books of ours. So thank you. I'm tuning in from home because unfortunately COVID is still a reality from time to time for all of us. And this was my time. So I am home with COVID, but recovering well. And I know that many are tuning in from all over, partly because today's topic is interesting and you want to have a peek into our collections and into the collections of the University of Pennsylvania. So thank you for tuning in. And for those of you in person, thank you for coming in in person so you get to see these objects in real life. So thank you for joining from wherever you are. We will get to see the magnificent manuscripts we've chosen on screen in real time. And before we begin, like I said, a couple housekeeping notes about the format today. For those of you in the room, I will point out that there are two emergency exits, one at the front where you came in and one at the back of the room. In the unlikely event that you should need them, that's where you can go one or two. And there are some of my colleagues in the room who will help um, if, help is needed. The other note is there are washrooms available back the way you came in down the purple gallery wall. You could admire some art on your way to the facilities, but there are toilets at the end of the hall there. For those of you on the Zoom, I trust you can find your own way to the facilities because I can't help you with that. Second, Coffee with a Codex, an hour of hours. That's what's brought us all together today. For those of you on the Zoom, if you need help, technical help, you can send an email or a message me in the Zoom chat. I'll be monitoring that throughout the event. You can also email us questions or comments, or if you need tech help, like I said, the email address is on screen. It's roar.library at mcgill.ca. And we do welcome chat. Share your questions and comments about the manuscripts as we page through. And we do ask that you respect the community spirit of this event. Um, share your ideas, share your comments, share your questions in the chat. Due to the size of the event, all the microphones and cameras except the presenters will remain off, but we welcome your engagement in the chat. Um, we will have a Q&A at the end, so both of you, those of you in the Zoom, put your questions in the chat. In the room, there is a microphone in the center of the chairs, and we ask that you come up to the microphone to voice your question, so both Zoom and room can hear you. The other a piece of housekeeping. It's not so much housekeeping as a historical perspective that we can start this event with, because this place, I'm not far from McGill's downtown campus, and McGill University is located on land that has long served as a place of meeting and exchange amongst Indigenous peoples, including the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations. Roar honors recognizes and respects these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and waters on which our buildings stand today. And though people today at this event are tuning in from all over, we like to take a moment to think about the place that houses our collections today, even though those collections, like the manuscripts we're looking at today, have also come from all over. And in particularly across the Atlantic, we are looking at European manuscripts today, books of ours. So, Housekeeping taken care of, and a moment to think back down the historical path to the, Indi the Indigenous people who stewarded these lands, and before that, 
these manuscripts from far further back in history. Today, we're going to be hearing from, like I said, <coughs> Nicholas Herman and Dot Porter from the University of Pennsylvania's Kislak Center for Special Collections and Manuscript Studies, and also from my colleague Anne-Marie Holland, who you see on screen, um, who's a librarian and curator for our manuscript collection here at McGill. So I'm going to stop my screen share now, and I'm going to pass the virtual microphone over to Dot and Nicholas in Pennsylvania. And before I, I officially, uh, I'll shut off my video, so you, you take the center screen, but I'm just going to um, say one comment in that Dot and, and Nick, we're delighted to have you joining us. And we're delighted also that you let us use your title because Coffee with the Codex is an ongoing series that Dot's gonna tell us a little bit more about. Um, but it does suggest that I should be having a cup of coffee alongside my Codex. Yeah. And we are not serving coffee for those of you who are there in person. It works very well for a virtual event. We do in real life keep our beverages and codices very far apart. So um, thank you Dot for bringing not only the title but your expertise and letting us join you for this special joint edition of Coffee with a Codex, where we get to have some of our books on screen next to each other and to see one and the comparison between the two. So on that note, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for uh, thinking this up and getting in touch with us. And uh, we're really happy to be here with uh, a few of our books of ours. I don't know how many we're actually gonna get to show, uh, but I'm gonna open with my regular spiel since this is Coffee with a Codex. Uh, welcome. Uh, if I see actually a couple of people that I recognize in the room, so that's really exciting and welcome to everyone else. So um, as Jacqueline said, Coffee with a Codex is actually entering its third year. So I started this event um, in 2021 in January, and it was right when I was allowed to come back into the building after the libraries had been closed for um, for several months. And being away from the collection was really hard. I know it was hard for a lot of people. And I said, uh, if they're going to let me in the in the building one day a week, I want to make it worth my while, and I want to make it worth other people's whiles as well. So I started doing a 30-minute Zoom call once a week, and I would just take a book off the shelf and do a little show and tell. So it's not a lecture. I'm not always an expert on what I'm talking about. I just love manuscripts, and I like showing them to people. So that's how it started. Um, it's now two years later, entering the third year. Very exciting. This is our first joint event, so this is great. Um, and Books of Hours, it's, uh, I think, notable, too, that we're doing Books of Hours because I decided at, in December at some point that 2023 was going to be the year of hours. So um, we participated uh, a few years ago in a digitization project called Bibliophily, where we digitized manuscripts across Philadelphia, which included over 100 Books of Hours. And so this is really a social media event to try to get through show off every single book of ours from Philadelphia that we digitized as part of Bibliophily. And so an hour of ours fits right in there just really well. Um, and so without further ado, I am actually gonna pass it on to uh, my colleague, Nick Herman, who is going to tell us more about books of ours because he's really the, the books of ours expert. And I think you said you wanted me to switch to the well, we can maybe we can keep uh, that until okay. uh, in in a moment. Um, but I may switch to the to the to, to the, the camera. camera. View, to, to, I'm actually speaking sort of from behind this camera arm, so just to please disregard that. And hello, everyone, and welcome. So, as Dot said, I'm Nick Herman. I'm the Lawrence J. Schoenberg Curator uh, here at the Schoenberg Institute for Manuscript Studies, which is a kind of think tank we run here at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries at the Kislak Center, um, which uh, is dedicated to the study of pre-modern manuscripts uh, in the sort of digital age. So this is how, this is a lot of what Dot and I do uh, is about uh, looking at manuscripts, studying them, uh, getting people interested in manuscripts using uh, new technologies. And of course, social media, Zoom, uh, is these are these are important parts of, of what we do and we have this wonderful collection as well uh the Schoenberg collection which is um comprised of about 300 pre-modern manuscripts that uh is, is a part of our kind of core collection here that we that we use a lot um books of ours Dot and I both have this uh, abiding interest in these amazing <laughs> books 
uh, which are described as medieval bestsellers. Uh, uh, and uh, indeed, they're the most um, widespread, most um, commonly surviving um, type of medieval book. And they're produced in huge numbers, hundreds of thousands um, in, uh, in Northern Europe between about the 13th century and then into the 16th century. Of course, first in manuscript, handwritten, and um, some of the examples we'll show you today are, of course, are handwritten, as, as most books of ours are. And then later on, uh, in beginning in the at the end of the 15th century, in print. So when with the development in Europe of the printing press, books of ours become, because they're so popular, they become, uh, they, they, they get into print, and then we have editions of books of ours. But the items we're starting with, of course, are manuscript, handwritten uh, documents. And... Um, like any manuscript, no no two are the same, right? They're all hand produced uh, uh, by scribes, by professional scribes. The books we're looking at today are produced really in, um, not by monks, as we often associate with the Middle Ages, manuscripts being produced by monks in monasteries. But by the time uh, books of hours are produced towards the end of the Middle Ages, uh, you really have scribes working as professionals uh, alongside other people in the book trade. Uh, including the illuminators, so the, the the people, the artists who produced the uh, uh, what we call the miniatures, the illustrations in books of hours, uh, as well as uh, artisans who specialized in all kinds of other types of decoration uh, that we see in, in a book of hours, and the binders, the book binders as well, um, are, are are involved. So it's a trade. It's a kind of uh, object. Book of hours is an object that is produced by many different artisans, and books of hours are. Um, are were so popular in the late Middle Ages because uh, they um, they contain prayers. So these are prayer books, um, but that could be said or, or recited by lay people. So people who were not uh, members of the clergy, ordained uh, uh, monks or priests. And in the late Middle Ages, there's a lot of uh, in, in in Western Europe, in uh, uh, Western Christianity, there's a lot of you know, devotion and fervor and a desire to recite prayers as a lay person that someone in a monastery might say every day to kind of mimic those rituals to be able to uh, ensure uh, that one would pass into heaven and not spend too much time in purgatory and also to pray for the souls of your deceased relatives and friends. So books of hours become very popular all throughout Europe uh, among a kind of rising uh, upper middle class, a kind of merchant class of people who were becoming increasingly literate. And books of hours are very important from the point of view of the history of literacy, because though many are in Latin, uh, in fact, most are in Latin, they contain small amounts of sort of directions and uh, uh, kind of signposting uh, that's often in the vernacular language. So in French or Italian or German or English. So books of hours are really a vehicle for early literacy among a slightly broader set of the population. Uh, so they're interesting from the point of view of the history of literacy, of private life. And also books of hours often uh, have information in them that tells us who their original owners were. And frequently, very interestingly, these owners, early owners or original owners turn out to be women. Uh, so we also have in the Book of Hours a, a type of book that's very important for the history of uh, of, of literacy among, among women and um, sort of private life and uh, domestic life uh, among, among women. And of course, as uh, many of you know, historically, uh, women are often sort of written out of uh, the major historical narratives. So Books of Hours are very important from that point of view. Uh, and then also um, artistically, uh, I speak as an art historian, but many of us art historians are not, are just supremely interested in books of hours because they're often very, very beautiful. They're produced uh, very lavishly quite often. Um, the example we have here at Penn that we're going to show you is a pretty nice one. But you at McGill, you folks have some really wonderful, beautifully produced uh, kind of stunner books of hours. Um, and uh, and so we're, we're, we're looking forward to exploring those with you. And Books of Hours also are interesting from a North American perspective because uh, they were, because they were passed down through families, they were often um, available on the antiquarian book market 
uh, much, you know, into the 20th century, 19th and 20th centuries, and even now. And so they've ended up in quite large numbers in North American libraries. So they're sort of, in a way, overrepresented compared to other types of books, which historically have been part of, you know, royal collections or imperial collections, or national collections in Europe that have stayed in Europe. So we have a lot of books of ours in North America. Um, Dot mentioned in Philadelphia, we have mm -hmm. over, over 100, over 100 yeah. uh, at, um, in Montreal and in Quebec. Uh, I know you have a, a significant number of them as well. And there was a wonderful exhibition uh, a few years ago of, of books of ours. So, you know, wherever you are, uh, you're probably not too far from a book of ours or even books of ours from Europe that have made their way to libraries in Australia and South Africa and parts of Asia. So um, so you're probably not far from book of ours. It'd be interesting to study on average how, you know, like how far, uh, how far we are from at any one time from a spider or a mouse. We're probably not that far from a <laughs> book of book ours of as well. Yeah. And I'll turn it over now uh, to, um, to and our Marie. Topic. There we go. Yeah, so I will spotlight you for everyone. And Emery, take it away. You can tell us more about the collection. Yeah, here at thank you for being here, everyone. Thank you for that wonderful introduction as well. So I'm here to give some context to our medieval collection and specifically our Books of Hours collections. Um, so we're going to approach also just the perimeter of the codex in question that we'll be studying. Um, McGill Library, so that you know we were talking numbers just recently, we house about 250 medieval manuscripts in Latin and or in the European vernacular languages. These include some 50 codices uh, being just bound books, um, as well as fragments of text, single leaves, bifolia, and excised elements such as illuminated initials, miniatures, and even border cuttings from illuminated manuscripts. The date range of our group covers the 9th to the 15th centuries. Um, most of the manuscripts are liturgical, so used for church service, or are private devotional works. And um, that's where we get into the category of the books of hours. Um, we have 37 beautiful exemplars of books of hours. Um, seven of these are bound books, and we'll be looking at one of these today close up and into the pages, a 15th century example produced in Burgundy, France. So a frequently asked question um, as the liaison librarian to this group of materials is how did McGill come to house medieval manuscripts? Well, institutional research collections are augmented essentially by acquisition and by donations. There are also transfers between units and maybe various um, colleges, but essentially acquisition and donation. Um, with regards to acquisitions, librarians work within the framework of annual allocated collections budgets, and along with spontaneous special funds for targeted collections, we may also be able to pick up something really, really special. Um, so we operate within the antiquarian rare book market, however you want to designate that, and we rely upon the expertise of certified dealers who produce these um, really lavish illustrated catalogs. And they're just really um, interesting to consider. Um, <clears throat> um, medieval manuscripts are, are very costly. So um, we don't have um, a set budget for, for purchasing medieval manuscripts. But um, just to let you know that the auction houses are still carrying a very healthy supply of medieval manuscripts. And this happens as estates are unloaded onto the market and uh, private library holdings um, fill up uh, the supply chain. Um, McGill also augments collections, especially medieval collections where the price is extremely high to buy. Uh, some of the stunning and valuable physical copies housed here at McGill come from benefactors, bibliophiles, place to have this um, um, object end up and um, you know avid collectors. Um, a word about when this medieval collection began. Um, McGill's medieval collection had its immediate beginnings as an exhibition uh, to illustrate the history of the book, exhibition material rather. So the former curator of manuscripts, Dr. Richard Ver, here in the room, explains that in the 1920s, Dr. Lomer, one of McGill Library's first librarians, launched an innovative project to create a small museum of the book inside the library and open to the public. 
Lomer's aim was to present a brief history of manuscript and printed books. So the core of the collection was purchased during the early 20th century, so from the 20s to the 1940s. Um, we purchased, well, they, they obtained major works from European dealers in London and Italy principally. Um, so a collection policy has guided our collection so that it functions as a coherent body of material and is ped pedagogically useful. Having the theme of the history of the book in mind helped to shape this collection into a useful bunch called upon for teaching. And indeed it is highly used in our teaching uh, rooms today. So after the 1940s, a second influence on the development of the McGill collection was that of the connoisseurship of certain Montreal collectors a list too long to name, but in this case where we're studying MS-154, this codex comes to us from Madeleine Perrault. Her husband was Joseph Edward Perrault, who was a lawyer and then deputy, deputy minister at the Parlement du Québec between 1916 and 1936. The Perrault family donated MS-154 as recently as July, 1975. So today, as research is conducted, we expand upon the descriptive entries in our finding aids and thus build upon the construction of knowledge. So far from being dormant collections of the past, there is a dynamic process of scholarship being accomplished on these precious, precious manuscripts every day. And um, I get to look over the shoulders of those doing this research, and it's always fascinating. Regarding McGill's collection of books of hours, there was an extensive research project carried out over four years on each and every one, which is the basis of now titled Le Catalogue Raisonné des Livres de Conservé au Québec, published in 2018 through the special funds from a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada grant. Um, it was accomplished by a team led by Professor Brenda Dunlardo with the collaboration of Ariane bergeron foot Geneviève Sanson and former curator of rare books and special collections, Dr. Richard Ver. So the collection presents 59 artifacts. It was on uh, as the uh, an exhibition at the Museum of Fine Arts as well, already mentioned. Um, so this is the most significant research to date on our books of ours, and it did build upon existing descriptions, whether brief or long, of our particular objects. The McGill books of ours at McGill are also integrated into resulting, uh, resulting byproduct of research being this highly visible full text website called Hore. We will be showing this right now um, and we'll, we'll send you the link in the chat so you can visit our, our website. Um, we're showing the, the picture um, of the homepage and we're now going to show you um, MS-154. So it's the red binding as we scroll down. Um, Gregory Houston of Digitization Initiatives at the time captured our objects at high resolution on state-of-the-art cameras in full color. Um, please do have a look at your own chance. These are also uploaded onto the Internet Archive and you can use the page turning device, which is always nice uh, to have instead of scrolling through the object. But either way, the images are just stunning and the zoom in features will allow you to look at um, the scripts up close. Um, it's, it's very uh, highly recommended reading. So let's go to the first binding here. Um, if we show you through the manuscript camera, manuscript 154, it was rebound in the 19th century in this attractive red velvet binding. Needs some repair at this point, we will do that. Um, it's imitating a choice cover used for bindings of medieval codices by the French aristocracy. So if we go down a bit into the volume to show the calendar, um, it's about at capture five. Um, but let's see, we'll just turn a few pages. It's interesting to note on the early leaves of the codex that there is an inscription in French denoting former ownership. And in this case, it reads à moi Tabereau 1606, um, meaning it's Guillaume Tabereau, according to our catalogue raisonné. And you'll notice at the top, um, we're gonna capture that there's a family motto um, inscribed at the top of the page, à tous les accords. Um, so in addition, just scrolling through these preliminary pages of the calendar, um, we're noticing some um, additional um, 
uh, personalized uh, dates. So we're enjoying this particular manuscript because it is um, made to um, reflect the family using this particular object. And that's very exciting to see. In other words, um, the highlight of this Books of Hours are the full page miniatures. Uh, sometimes miniatures are contained within floral borders, but in this case, we're seeing uh, full page miniatures and 13 um, in all. And you notice the rich tones of blue. Uh, it's just quite stunning. So I'm gonna turn this manuscript over to our colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania and let's hear more about it. Well, first of all, this is a beautiful example, um, uh, particularly this miniature on the right that comes after the calendar. So the calendar, uh, which we just, uh, or, or, or you or we just leafed through, just saw, saw um, this is very, very frequently, I would say in about 95% of the of cases, what is the first section of a book of hours. Mm -hmm. And it records uh, the feast days for each um, day of each month. So what you see uh, at the top of the page on the right um, is uh, in red is the name of the month. And I can't it's December. It, December. Think, so we're the last, last the last leaf yeah. makes sense. So that's um, December. Yeah. And it says December has 31 days and 30 moons. So it right there, it tells you some lunar information. Do they always do that? in the calendar not always okay. not, sometimes it'll just have the the month yeah. um and um here it's in latin but sometimes it's in french or another language um and um you've got feast days so the the the, the black and red text so on the right is the first half of december this is goes to december 15th and if we turn the page we would have the the last half of december and it's like that for each month so a calendar so is november on the or that's December. The, this is December. This is the end of December. And right. then on the other leaf. Yes. And so um, flipping just back to the page, the December page, the, the first half of December, you can see something really interesting in that. Um, so not every day of the year has an important feast day uh, in the church calendar, perhaps. So um, someone has written in later uh, some extra saints days there. Uh, you can see on the right in the smaller writing. Yeah, there's like three of them and they've been added later. So, that, so that that's point. interesting because it shows us, you know, that this, as, as we saw with the ownership inscription right. at the front, this book is being used. It's being used past the time that it was actually made. And that's yeah. one of the, it's, you know, really interesting features of, of books of ours. They mm -hmm. often have, you know, later information. Yeah. Um, and some, some specialists can look at the writing and kind of tell you, you know, when exactly it yeah. was written. instead of just saying, oh, it's later, which is what I always say, because, but you know, is it from you know. 50 years after the book was right. made? If it is it from a hundred years after the book was made? Right. Um, and then the calendar also um, in the, in the columns on the left of each of these pages, you can see all these Roman numerals and uh, letters. And um, those have sort of specifics so of the, the sort of main column of red Roman numerals on the left um that is those are roman numerals that go up to 19 and don't always occur right on each day and that that's the lunar cycle so the lunar cycle happens on an apparently on a 19 year cycle mm -hmm. and um and uh so if you were in a year you know 19 you know you would look for the number 19 in that column and that's when you'd have a new moon that kind of help. Oh, I see. So kind of keep, you know, helps keep yeah, yeah. track of, of the lunar information. Mm -hmm. And I think on the left, the little letters, I think someone's gone in and written the numbers of the days of the month. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Must go to, if that's November, it would go to 30. 30. Yeah. Um, and that looks later because in, in the Middle Ages, the main way of telling time. Yep. Yeah, look at that. Was was not through numbers as we use. It was through the name of the saint day. Right. So we still have this in a vesti vestigial as you know aspect of this in Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, right? Oh, right. That we recognize right, as, right. as saints' days. Um, but in the Ooh, Middle Ages, we recognize almost every day. 
by its saints day and you wouldn't really use the number mm -hmm. system so someone's gone in and added that i think jacqueline has a question there's um a comment from the zoom room actually um tim nelson hoys has suggested that it could be golden numbers the column on the left does that um the column on the the, the left um i think those are just added those are those are the just indicating the, new moon and used to calculate Easter. oh yes so the 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 the, the numbers in red the, the the roman roman numerals in red that indicate the 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 new moons yes golden numbers or they're called you know uh, that, that's what, Is I that think what that's, they're called I think the that could be numbers. what they're called yeah and then to the right of those roman numerals there are letters that go from a to g and um that's relatively simple that's just seven a cycle of seven letters uh and so that tells you what day is a Sunday? Uh, so if you were in a oh, right. B year, every B is every you know is a Sunday, right? Um, and of course, that's a that's a seven uh, letter cycle. So that's the calendar. This calendar doesn't have any um, sort of adornment. Um, it's got the KL. It has the, the KL, illuminated KL yeah. at the top, yeah. Um, which is that's what and that's cal. It's calendar. Calends is the is what that is but so that's telling you you know the first day of the month and telling mm -hmm. you that you're in a, in a calendar but there's no um illustration and and um relatively frequently in fact our book of hours right um, well when we take a look we'll see when we take a look more. of it at it uh yeah it, it's got um uh what does it have dot it has um uh zodiac z yeah so it, it has uh i mean we'll we'll take a look but we'll, it, but we'll it, 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 it has illustrations yeah. so that they relate to the, the time of the, the month and um and um, but if we turn past the calendar now, um, there we go. That's so pretty, beautiful. <laughs> so this is a uh, illustration of Saint John, so the uh, uh, evangelist, so who wrote one of the Gospels. Um, and this is a text we frequently find at the beginning of uh, after the calendar of a Book of Hours. This is an excerpt from the Gospel of Saint John, and Saint John is. Um, associated with the island of Patmos, where he wrote. Oh, and so he's sitting on an so island. On an I see island. that. I was going to ask you how you knew that was. That yeah, was gone, I think. But... And so artists often have a lot of fun showing this scene because, um, you know, you can kind of uh, flex your uh, your landscape uh, artistry. Yeah. Uh, and look at the castles in the background. This is a very beautiful example of that. Um, and um and also just, of course, every corner of uh, Europe had different artistic traditions and different styles. And uh, this particular book is associated with Burgundy. So this is, you know, east, southeast of Paris in, in France. And um, we've got these amazing, this frame with these, this golden frame with these kind of white figures, I guess, that are meant to look like statues. Mm -hmm. And then a little scene, I can't quite make out what's going on, but there's a scene at the bottom. Uh, which might be from the life of saint john so it's yeah that's very i think they're made of kind of painted with gold, gold. beautiful which um makes it a little hard to see them yeah <laughs> yeah but very beautiful uh we have a couple of questions in the chat um I, there's a running discussion about the calendar that, that it's a perpetual calendar and that it's infused as well with a lot of folk folklore related to the lunar phases um and one other follow-up question wanting a little more information if we have it or discussion of the construction of the book and and i read the wrong thing what is it yes construction of the book so that question from the zoom if you get to that topic Right. I don't know if we'll, I mean, the construction of the book in terms of maybe in general, uh, in general. So, um, so it would have been the way that the way that books of ours often, and I can't necessarily speak for this one, but often they, um, they were, as, as Nick mentioned, they were made um, in scriptoria by, um, you know, by, by various different types of artists and scribes and um, you wouldn't, it's not like you would go to the books of hours store and buy a book of hours off the shelf. You would go in and you would say what you wanted and they would sort of make it for you. And so it was um, oftentimes to some extent, a sort of modular experience. So there are lots of different, um, the, uh, the hours of the Virgin 
like the calendar is sort of this one of the central parts of a books of hours but then you would also have um the hour the the hours of the dead and other types of hours and various types of prayers some of which are found more or less and so frequently but not always when you look at the physical structure, what you find is that these sections are written in individual choirs. This is sheets that are folded and bound um, and then bound together. Sometimes the, um, the, the uh, miniatures, uh, like the one that you're seeing, sometimes they will be on their own page and there won't, in this case, we see that there's text on the reverse. Sometimes you won't have text on the reverse um, and the, the sheets will actually be inserted by themselves indicating that the art was made in one place and the text was written in another and then they were bound together um, later on. So uh, another example is the, the calendar always, I don't think I've ever seen a calendar that wasn't either a single choir of 12 leaves or two choirs of six leaves uh, bound together. Um, even if the rest of the manuscript has choirs of eight leaves um, altogether. So. Yeah, it's, it's, it's super, that. super interesting. No, that just that the way, the way the books are constructed as, as Dot said in a kind of modular way. Yeah. Is... And they could be in all kinds of different orders as yeah, well. Yeah. The texts are often, and it just depends on what the person uh, who had it made sort of wanted absolutely from it so and and so um what we have here we saw that 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 beautiful second full page illustration um which shows the annunciation so the message of the um uh archangel gabriel to the virgin mary uh, that mm -hmm. she's going to be the mother of jesus this is this is uh, another one that you see uh, you see this image very frequently mm -hmm. and this opens this this is called the hours of the virgin so these are right. eight sets of prayers that Jennifer, uh, can I just interrupt that, for one moment? The sure. hands you see on screen is my colleague Jennifer Garland. Um, so oh. it, I'm introducing Jennifer's fingers at the moment. But Jennifer, there's a request if you could zoom in at all on the miniature, that would be appreciated or lifted up. Wow. Yeah. This is a very, very beautiful um example of uh an image of the Annunciation. And this artist in particular working in, in Burgundy is, is really um, interested in these sort of secondary scenes, yeah, that we would maybe call vignettes that are in the in the, the, margins. In the margin. So mm -hmm. these all represent um, kind of episodes, in this case of the life of the Virgin Mary, so related to the central scene. So in the bottom left, there's Mary in blue getting married to Joseph. Uh, and then on the right uh, is that's kind of a um, flashback to her going to the temple uh, when she's a child. And um, is that her with Anne? I think that on the left, that's uh, maybe her with St. Anne or that might be her parents, be parents. A, a meeting. So so you have this amazing all of these uh, we call vignettes. And in our book of ours, which is not quite as nice as this very beautiful example. I have it's to say, I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm a bit jealous because I, 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 he's an art historian. I, I love, you can be uh, jealous. There's, there's, really there's a lot of admiration and love in the chat for the vivid ink that's used, the blues in particular, and yeah. that shield in the center bottom vignette caught the attention. Is that a coat of arms? And then a follow-up question as well. What can you tell us about the inks and how they're so vibrant even today? This is 1500s that this was made and now it's 2023 so how is it so vibrant today so someone in the chat has has put their finger on it for the blue that that this is lapis lazuli which is this mm -hmm. wonderful mineral pigment a uh, i mean a stone that's extracted actually from a mine uh, that was found in in uh, present you know in the in, in the area of present day afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, and this was a very very precious blue pigment that's immediately recognizable just because it's, it's so, so vibrant. So vibrant. Yeah. Um, we don't have any in our. No, ours ours is sort of made exactly. with sort of more diluted uh, <laughs> pigments. But yeah, uh, you can see this beautiful, oh, this is an amazing wow. use of the blues and greens. Um, this is later in the hours of the Virgin, so this the central part of the Book of Hours, um, and this is the uh, Annunciation to the shepherds. So these shepherds, you see, they've got 
little sheep all around them. Um, those are funny looking sheep. Yeah, or maybe is that or actually those white? Uh, <laughs> I'm are those, not sure that's sheep. Are those those might be rocks? I think, that's sheep. I think the sh oh, then the, and then on the right there are there some I guess cows or or yeah. bulls or something, but they're 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 receiving the message that um, right. Jesus has been born. So, um, but this amazing landscape with all these blues. Um, and why are these so vibrant today? Well, because it's one of the wonderful things about manuscripts. They, they're, they've they been closed 99.9% of their uh, lifetimes. So, um, you know, if they're kept safe, there's no damage really. To, there's no fading of the colors. Um, there's no, uh, you know, um, um, you know, no, no damage. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of the ink, um, so, the, so the color you see in these miniatures is is paint. It's painted with a brush, um, whereas the text is written with ink. And the difference being that ink is is produced with um, very specific materials, with oak galls, which are grow on oak trees and contain a lot of tannins. So the ink, which is applied with a quill, you know, made with a, with a feather, um, bites into the parchment. Um, and is really long lasting. Uh, the paint uh, on on the image on the right, you know, is painted on the surface, so it can sometimes flake off if the book mm -hmm. has been roughly, you know, handled. And also, I think the probably the fact that the paint has lasted so long. It's not only that the book has been closed, but also it's a testament to the quality of the paint mm -hmm. as well. Like mm -hmm. this is high quality paint because you do find books that even when they're sitting closed on the shelf, it flakes off just because it wasn't great to begin with. And that along with the blue, I mean, if you could, couldn't could guess just from looking at it, because the art is very good. This was an expensive, yeah. an expensive book uh, to have made. Somebody um, somebody really wanted a very fine book. The, the parchment is also um, very nice. Um, and even though they're, I don't know, even though I'm, I'm noticing as we, as we go through, there isn't actually a lot of decoration on the text page, right. aside from their, the small illuminated initials and then the, the sort of red and the blue fillers on the lines. Um, but there isn't a lot in the margins. But the fact there's that actually a question in the chat about just that why the margins are so large on the text blocks and smaller on the illustration pages. So I would say, and Nick can disagree with me, um, I think that everything here speaks to somebody with a lot of money making decisions about how they wanted what they wanted to spend their money on in the in the book. So they had a budget. Um, so there aren't so they have big margins, parchment's expensive. Big margins can say, well, I can afford to not fill all the parchment. Mm -hmm. So I have these big margins and they're not filling it in. I don't know if it's an, like, it's impossible to say, is it an aesthetic choice? Is it a money choice? Why they don't have, because you do find very fancy books of ours that have a lot of marginal gold and color and everything, but they seem to be focusing on these full page, um, full page miniatures, which are really amazing. And as you, everybody notices, there's a lot of blue, and that would have been very expensive because lapis lazuli would have had to be imported. Yeah, yeah. Um, it wasn't yeah. from where? 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 where from, from, Afghanistan. from Afghanistan. I mean, you know, so this is a material that's transited through many intermediaries. Yeah. And caravans and this you know the this part of the silk roads um and um you know so it's actually more expensive in many instances than gold so it's, it's yeah. a very prized uh pigment mm -hmm. but all of this these features of this particular book of ours they set up a really good contrast with uh ours so uh, is it would could we transition to our overhead camera or maybe look at both at the same mm -hmm. time yeah why don't you keep yours out and we'll just we'll we'll um switch uh yeah oh this is nice the side by side if everyone can see this yeah. <laughs> um, so this is our book of ours which which um th these are both books that are made in in france uh around the last quarter of the 15th century mm -hmm. so between about uh 1475 and, and 1500 and uh ours you can tell right away and i don't think it's just the different cameras it's the parchment's a bit yellower, mm -hmm. not as nice and, and kind of creamy white. Uh, and uh, it's a little smaller. 
But our book does have, and it's hard to see that, but it does have an original leather binding that has bit. some stamped designs on it. And yeah. this is quite unusual because uh, these books are often rebound. So your book has this velvet, which is, is much more recent. Um, ours happens to have this quite damaged and repaired, but it nonetheless probably original binding. Um, and then the calendar. So this is a great. So we're both January, <laughs> the first half of January. And um, our calendar has these borders uh, and these little uh, rectangular scenes. Uh, and this one shows feasting of a two-headed person. So this is Janus. This is the sort of ancient symbol of looking backwards, looking forwards, as you would in January. You know, this is where we are now. Uh, we are somewhere around here in January. Um, and and then you'll see on the left, you have religious scenes. So normally you'd have the Zodiac here, which mm -hmm. we don't have in our book at the calendar. We have sort of religious scenes that are related to the month. And then here we have activities. So we saw feasting here for February, keeping warm. And those are the labors of the month. Is what so those, those are called. the labors of the month. So it's activities that you do every month. Right. And there's... Jonah, right? Jonah and the whale. So that's sort of unclear what that's related to, but that that's one of the unusual features <laughs> of this book. But yes, so Lisa, I was hoping you, Lisa would say something because I didn't want to say something unless Lisa did. Lisa has looked at this manuscript quite a lot, and she has, I think, on Twitter, there's probably a thread um, that she makes an argument that the biblical scenes that appear in place of what would usually be zodiac uh, scenes are actually representing the signs of the zodiac which i think is um right so gemini is adam and eve for example as she says there so i just think that's really i think it's really yeah. um it's really cool actually um and i think sometimes people are surprised to, to find out that the zodiac is represented in a prayer book like this because i think we don't th tend to think of the zodiac in this way but but in fact throughout the middle ages zodiac thinking was all over the place. So, um, and not only in prayers, but in medicine and um, all kinds of things. So, so I'm going to shut up about No, that's Zodiac. fascinating. I'm glad <laughs> our, our friend and colleague Lisa over. Fagan Davis is, is here, who's, who's a great expert as well. Um, and uh, so here's the end of our calendar, the end of December. Um, and our calendar, I think unlike yours, has, uh, it's, and it's hard to see on screen, but some of these... Um, uh, yours has sort of blackish brown ink and red ink. Ours has blue ink and red ink. And then and it gold. has gilded letters. Yeah. So um, you'll see that this is the end of December. And so there's this whole cluster, these these five gilded days. And of course, that's Christmas, um, St. Stephen's Day, St. John's, etc. So there's a kind of, um, you can always sort of tell in a book of hours with, that has kind of um, gilded feast days, the important ones especially at the end of December, but it's got the same uh, golden numbers. In this case, they're actually gold. Literally and, golden, yeah. And, and the dominical, the Sunday letters, and ours, the A for the Sunday letters, for just incidentally, is sort of um, more prominent. Then we have some later, probably 17th century notes. And um, these are the equivalent pages. This is so great to have these two books uh, open at the same the same time. And yeah, so there's St. Saint Saint John there's again. St. John. Yep. He's got a bit of a lake behind him, so you could sort of say it's an island. Uh, and then, as happens occasionally, you get the three other uh, evangelists, um, so the gospel writers as well, whereas in your example, it just has St. John. I don't know if you can see, I mean, the color-wise, there's quite a contrast between these two books. And that's because your book is made with much higher grade pigments and by a much, um, I don't want to use too many value judgments, but a much more accomplished artist. Our book, uh, so your book is made in Burgundy. Our book is made in uh, the Northwestern part, uh, part of France uh, in Rouen, in Normandy, um, it, about the same time. But this just gives you an idea that there, there are grades of quality of these books. But what our book has, we were talking about this a minute ago, which yours doesn't, uh, is these borders on every page. Mm -hmm. And they're, um, they have a nice effect. You know, they make the book look very kind of rich. 
and each border is different, which is really interesting there. I mean, they're the same from the recto side of the page to the verso side of the page. So they reuse whatever the they kind of trace was. through, yeah, they mm -hmm. trace through the pattern, but they're uh, page to, or leaf to leaf, they're all different. And um, some sections are highlighted, you know, with a larger uh, border. This is the obse crote. This is a particular, a prominent prayer to the Virgin Mary that gets a kind of section, you could call it a section break. Mm -hmm. um, and here's the other the important prayer, the Oen Temerata, that gets this, this border. Um, so the effect is kind of different. And I think Dot is absolutely right that this book is a little bit, even though it has all these border decorations, is a bit more prosaic. It's like somebody who wanted something kind of flashy, but flashy, but trashy. Flashy, I, don't know. But tra <laughs> I don't know about, about that, but it's clearly like they've spent their money in different places. Yes. Like yes. Um, the parchment in this one is fine, but it's not fine. Like the other one is fine. And the, if we compare these, so this is our um, Annunciation and then the McGill Annunciation, um, you know, this, there's a lot more going on here. Um, but the blue is, this is not lapis blue. This is some, um, some other kind of blue. And somebody else mentioned, I saw further up the chat, um, they made the point that mineral, mineral paints last longer than, um, than like paints made out of plant material, for example. Sure. Uh, and they would have been, plant material would have been a lot less expensive than yes. um, mineral yes. too. And just the, the, you know, their pigments could be, um, kind of diluted to save money. And, um, you know, I think you get that impression here looking at these two images side to side. And, and also artistically, um, so here we have the main scene of the Annunciation as yours, as your book of ours has, but we also have, and we also have vignettes that some of the scenes are the same. So this one is the marriage of the Virgin Mary and St. Joseph, which you have also in the bottom left. But here they're painted kind of a little bit crudely in these uh, circular medallions and by different artists, a different artist than the, the artist who made the main scene. And then these borders are also by yet again, Another one or artist. more other artists. So this is a sort of um, kind of workshop, almost mass production piece mm -hmm. that kind of com comes together and forms a sort of pleasing whole. But the image you have in yours, um, you know, is a, is a kind of all by the same artist. And it's a kind of, um, three-dimensional co concept, you know, it's a building and you've got these kind of uh, little spaces and niches within it. So it's mm -hmm. a sort of, it's more of a, I would say, kind of artistically original right. composition um, where the artist has more leeway and uh, as Dot said, maybe the but more budget to just kind of mm -hmm. do their own thing. Whereas what we have is, is a kind of um, very sort of, I mean, almost like a paint by numbers right. uh, product. It doesn't mean it's not interesting or, or beautiful or, or important, but it's just a different yeah. type of product. Yeah. And if you look at enough books of ours, you'll see a whole lot of books of ours that look a lot like this one. This is a sort of a... We're being, we're being sort of judgmental, but well, it's I okay. I love this book. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not... There are other reasons to love it. Like all of the things that Lisa is, is looking at with the, you know, especially with the calendar, right. but... Another there's um, oh, there's been a healthy stream of questions in the chat, oh, good, and I'll good. just join my voice to to them and extend an invitation to those who are attending in the room. If you have questions, you can come up to the microphone that's in the center of the chairs and you can voice your questions there. Um, and there are please keep putting them in the chat. We've got like about 10 minutes left and we'd be happy to continue the conversation. Um, and the most recent question is actually about that four in one image, which I believe was possibly the first one in your mm -hmm. yep. mm -hmm. Um Somebody's asking for resources um, because there was a comment in the chat as well that all four miniatures in in one was meant that it was from the Rue area. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a previous question in the chat about resources for identifying where the area Book of Hours might be coming from based on the artistic style. Um, so that person, it might be the same person asking, but looking for resources about areas to identify or yeah. ways to identify the origins of a book based on the artistic construction. And um, Jacqueline, I was wondering, we have a question in the house also. Should we start with um, with our question on site? How about we answer the Ruane question and then go to on site? Okay. okay. So, so um, that's a great question. And um, 
there are, you know, there are many, many, there's a lot of literature on books of hours, a lot uh, are digitized as well, um, uh, many thousands, you know, so there, there's kind of a vast literature, but the kind of reference work that begins to talk a little bit about the different artistic styles is really by Roger Wick, who uh, is a curator at the Morgan Library, uh, and two major books, Time Sanctified and Painted Prayers, um, both by Roger Wick. And of course, if you contact Dot or uh, me, uh, we can, we can send, you, send you some more bibliography. Um, but then the other thing that we haven't talked about, I'll just mention very briefly, is that um, books of hours have something called a use. And this is uh, generally in the hours of the Virgin, so the section that opens with the Annunciation, um, tiny little variants in the prayers in Latin um, that are specific to different cities in Europe. Mm -hmm. And so there are on, on, online, there are tools for looking at this. There are also publications where you can look up a sp specific parts of the Hours of the Virgin and determine what the use is. The use means the, the kind of... Um, liturgy of a particular mm -hmm. area or region right uh, and so that can help pinpoint a location um, in addition to the artistic style which um, is uh, you know is studied by art historians and there are some great exhibition catalogs um, that will you know go through an entire region or country or maybe just a city's um, book production history and uh, it's really by comparing these images with others um, and, and there are all sorts of little features, for example, yes, dividing the, these portraits into having the four portraits here as opposed to the single one is, is maybe more typical of Rouen. Um, so there's a kind of the different approaches, the text, also the calendar, of course. The calendar is, 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 a, is the one I was thinking of because the calendar that it lists sometimes very, very local saints days. And so that can be a really good uh, way to date to place and also to to date because if saints were not popular and then they become popular and then they lose popularity if you see a saint or you don't see a saint that you expect to see um given where you think the manuscript was made the calendar can actually be really helpful in that regard yeah so, so do we have another question from the from the room, from the room? first of all thank you very much i thought this was fascinating to the presenters also Congratulations. I had two questions. One of them was already answered because I was curious about the ink and the paint. And I, uh, I found that fascinating about the comment about the stone or the gem, the mineral comes from Afghanistan and that, that traveled all the way to Europe. The other question I had, something I always find interesting is, which hasn't nobody has spoken about, we're a public library, we're a public institution as a library. And what I always find fascinating is how these items are incorporated into teaching and learning, and particularly undergraduate teaching. Now, I have to confess, I'm a colleague of Anne Marie's, and she's been very good at giving me information to share with people. I wonder if you could, my, our colleagues at Penn can comment about that kind of thing. But how these are used in the, in the classroom? In the classroom, yeah. I mean, we, we um, um, use these items extensively in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I mean, every day, um, and um, Dot and I both teach classes at all, all levels. So um, not just undergraduates and graduate students and scholars, but also um, Dot does amazing programming with um, students from uh, elementary schools. Um, and not so much, so, and unfortunately, COVID sort of put a bite in that. But before COVID, I would had nursery school and elementary school classes come in to look at manuscripts and um, I also do virtual classroom visits, which is really great because it um, that's a way for for classes who are at institutions that don't um, necessarily have their own special collections can talk with me for an hour, an hour and a half, look at some of our books in the same way that we're doing now, right through Zoom. Um, so that's a so that's a really nice way to do it. But yeah, we we teach so nick teaches classes actually you have a class you're teaching this semester with a professor in um in history of history science, of science. On, on medieval diagrams yeah uh, so, so that's all, all kinds of things all kinds of things of course the english department um 
Obviously. Absolutely. But we, we, you know, we, our collection is a teaching collection. It is a teaching so, collection. you know, we encourage use of our materials um, as many, you know, university libraries do. Um, and part of the reason, I mean, this book is, was acquired for teaching. Um, it's a wonderful book of ours. It's very precious, but um, you know, it's, I would say it's not priceless or irreplaceable in the sense that we, we'd rather have people using it. I mean, obviously with appropriate caution and respecting all of our guidelines. Whereas there are some libraries, you know, that have prestigious royal objects, uh, mm -hmm. you know, famous objects that, you know, logically for, for good reason are, are less accessible and are perhaps not used in teaching. So we, we try to balance, you know, preservation of the materials, but also accessibility. And I think I'm sure at, at McGill, it's, it's, you, you have similar discussions. And Marie, do you want to comment about the classes that are using these manuscripts this term? I know we have a busy teaching schedule this term. Oh, yeah, um, in fact, we have several departments in the Faculty of Arts mainly. So we would have um, uh, English literature studying medieval texts come and sometimes do a few classes here to look at some of our medieval literary man manuscripts. Um, and we put them out on display. We try to have um, the students come up close and be in proximity to these historical objects. It usually does inspire students as they walk away. They get a better knowledge um, through the artifact of a historical period just by virtue of animal skin, the inks, the care in transcribing text. Um, we also host, um, since we have a large antiphonal um, component to our medieval manuscripts, we do have events and students come from the music faculty um, to study um, our, our music related objects. Um, and we've had several events concerning a large choir book, which today incident incidentally is going off for restoration and we're so pleased. Well, that's great news. Yeah, we Thanks, are. Anne -Marie. So many events around them. Yeah, so I will pin everyone, all the books and all the people here. And <laughs> I'll say a big thank you because we've hit our hour. So thank you so much for a joint session, for getting these two books right up on screen next to each other. It was a lot of fun to see the side-by-side -side comparison and to hear not only your discussion as we look through these, but also an amazing conversation and sidebar discussion in the Zoom chat. We are out of time, so I apologize if there were questions in the room that we didn't get to, but thank you very much. There are future editions of Coffee with the Codex, and we will send the link out in a follow-up. We'll send out resources, the recording, and links to our collection, ORE, the website where you can explore the digitized holdings. If you're in the Montreal area, come and see us Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. Dot, do you want to give your spiel? <laughs> Maybe. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so we do Coffee with the Codex every Thursday now at noon. Uh, and I did, I put the link in there. I think it's kind of got buried, but if you could send it out, you know, um, everybody is welcome. It's about like this, actually even less formal um, than this was, but I'm always happy to show off our collection and to answer questions as well as I can. Um, and thank you so much. Jacqueline yes. for thinking this up and for inviting us. And thank you, Anne Marie, for uh for everything and um Jennifer for the hands. That was yes, great. I was gonna say a thank you to the hands <laughs> behind thank the you for the hands. who make this work. Yeah. And a special was... thank you on my part to my colleagues who stepped in on the tech side. Uh, a big round of applause for everyone to make the hybrid setup work on our end. So thank you, everyone, and we'll say good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Okay.